course, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to talk about, uh, continue uh, about ancient China. Pre predominantly, I'm going to talk about mostly uh, the, the Qin dynasty or Qin dynasty, it's called, and then the Han dynasty. I'll talk about those two. If I have any time left, I might just talk for a few minutes about the Tang dynasty, which kind of happens a little bit after the Han, which is the other one that was real famous in the golden age of China, which is what we're getting into uh, right now. I think from the previous class, we had a class lecture. I had gotten up to, I think, the period, uh, we were talking about like the, the, the um, Chinese uh, period of uh, the 100 schools of thought. We were talking about Confucianism and Taoism and all that. And I think we had talked about the the uh, Warring States period, which is about where we're at, I think, right now, uh, talking about. So they have another dynasty that comes in uh, that's called the, it's either called either Qin or Qin. You know, either, you know, they usually pronounce it either way. Usually Qin dynasty is the way we say it in the West. So you got the Qin dynasty uh, that comes in, which is a very brief dynasty, which only had three rulers, uh, which, of course, they talked about the founder of it uh, in the video. Emperor Chen Shi, um, and then he had two sons that briefly reigned for about three or four years uh, afterwards. And um, the um, this dynasty came in uh, in the period of the Warring States, like at the end of it. It was like one of those states uh, that we had talked about before that had fought against each other. It was a period period of about two and a half centuries from about 481 to 221 BC, where he had these really seven major Chinese states that kind of vied for power over time. And this happened at the end of the Eastern Cho period, because the Eastern Cho was declining. It was in that feudal period we talked about before. And by the way, these are the seven warring states usually that fought it out. Qin, Qi, Chu, Yan, Han, Zhao, and Wai. Well, those are the, the seven ones. And the one you see at the beginning there, Qin or Qin, uh, is the one that eventually overwhelms all the other ones, conquers them, pretty much annexes, you know, all the all the um, those con those countries into their one state uh, that they have later. And so you get this new state that emerged. Well, originally it's called the Kingdom of Qin or Qin. You know, as they called it, it grew stronger and stronger and stronger uh, until it just overwhelmed all the other ones. And by 221, uh, it, of course, had conquered uh, all, all, all that area of China you're looking at uh, in that map. So at least at that time, China itself was mostly like in the eastern central part of it. So it wasn't much in the west, like western China. They were starting to push into southern China and up in Manchuria. They weren't up in there yet. So it's only like, I don't know, one third the size of maybe what China will be, uh, of course, later. And um, got some other slides here, like, of course, this one here, of course, shows a picture of the emperor. That's the first emperor of China. It, they say it different ways, Emperor Qin or Emperor Qin. I think they say Qin Shi or Qin Shi. And then you'll see it as also Qin Shi Wang or Wang Di. The actual name means first emperor of China. Uh, in fact, the word Wang Di is supposed to the word in Chinese meaning emperor. And you can see the word China came from the word, his, his name of Qin. Uh, so first emperor of China. Uh, and um, we'll get to it later. Uh, of course, uh, besides unifying China into one empire, uh, he's famous for building the Great Wall of China and also that mausoleum they told you about uh, with the terracotta army. Uh, that's some, some of the things he's, of course, known for, uh, Chen Shi. And um, let's keep it on that one, I guess. And um, so here's like his you know, full name, uh, they called it. So, yeah, he reigned 221 to 210 B.C. That should be the correct dates, uh, although his reign went back before that. He was actually king of the Qin, or Qin, and then after he conquered all of China, he then was emperor for around 20 years, actually 10 years, excuse me, 10, 11 years. Now you see his sons also, you know, founded as well. So he's the founder of the dynasty, founder of the empire, 
And um, I just mentioned here, of course, that most of it's in the eastern central parts of where it was. Now, let's talk about the main thing he's known for, well, besides the terracotta army, which that really, they didn't find out about that until the 20th century. Of course, everybody knew he's the one that started the Great Wall of China, or at least before that, they had already built some fortifications going back to the period of the Warring States, but he was one of the first to build a um, linear fortification that was constructed on their northern border to protect their state. And um, the early Great Wall of China was not built of brick or stone. It was actually built of like earth or mud. So they used like rammed earth, I think they called it. Uh, they had like peasants mostly that would construct it. There's been a big debate about how many people worked on it or how many people died, you know, building it. Uh, but um, I think it's anywhere from like 100,000 to 1 million people may have actually died constructing the, the Great Wall of China. Why was it built? Uh, it was mostly built as a fortification to uh, block out barbarians uh, from invading uh, China from the north, uh, mostly in Mongolia. And uh, most of them either came from Mongolia or from the Mongolian steppe, which is kind of between Mongolia and uh, what is China around the Gobi. Uh, and uh, the main group that the Chinese try to block uh, in China, which you may have heard of, was a group called the Shang Nu, uh, which uh, the pronunciation of it is, um, I think I put it somewhere, uh, thought, yeah, right here, Shang and then Nu, uh, basically. They're like a type of nomadic people, and they used horses to, of course, cross the Gobi Desert and, and strike, of course, into the northern territories of the Chinese Empire. Uh, and uh, they were famous for fighting on with a composite bow, swords, and spears. Uh, and um, it's been a debate about who they're related to, uh, the Shang Nu. Uh, some people think the Shang Nu somehow related to the Mongols. Uh, of course, there's another theory that later that they may have been the ancestors of the Huns, you know, like Attila the Hun, uh, that later attacked the Roman Empire. They came across Asia and Europe. So it's kind of a debate about you know, how they're related, but they not, might not be directly related to the later Mongols, like of Genghis Khan. It's a little later, Genghis Khan, like 13th century uh, CE. So it was like a linear fortress, you know, running from pretty much, you know, east to west, uh, from like, starts like where the Yellow Sea is and goes all the way to the Gobi Desert. Uh, and, um, of course, if you watch that documentary, there's a debate about, like, how long the wall is. Uh, it's, it's still kind of, I've seen different numbers on this, anywhere from three to 6,000 miles is usually the, Average, I put it at like maybe around close to 4,000 miles. So it's a big debate about that, about how long the wall is. I think in the video, there's they say it's like, um, I forget the number they said, but I thought they said that the amount of walls constructed was like something like, I thought they said 30,000 miles or some crazy amount or something. At one point, they built over like 2,000 years of walls. I think the mean wall itself is like three to 4,000 miles that they actually built of course, later. And uh, the wall itself has all kinds of nicknames. The, the Great Wall is more of a modern name that you're, uh, I guess Europeans and foreigners started calling it uh, later. Chinese call it either the Chinese Wall, or they have another name for it now, which means 10,000 Li Wall, which 10,000 Li means 5,000 kilometers. So 5,000 kilometer wall which would make it like somewhere between three to 4,000 miles long. Also, they do sometimes also call it the wall of death uh, because they believe that um, it may have been used as a cemetery to bury the workers when they died. They buried them inside the wall, which I don't know if they've ever been able to really prove that or not. So they used to joke that the Great Wall of China was the longest cemetery on earth. <laughs> I like that one, longest cemetery on earth. So anyway, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, up to 1 million workers die, but I don't, I don't know if they really know how many. That's something that they're not sure about. But I see anywhere from 100,000 to 1 million people may have 
actually died building it. Uh, the average height of the wall is about 25 feet tall. Uh, so pretty tall in length. And then the average width is somewhere between, I see varies on that, 15 to 20 feet, I think is usually the width of the wall. The walls are also known for having a lot of watchtowers. Like if you see, of course, pictures of a wall, which are well, a lot of the later wall was built. You can see it was built over the northern border, you know, of China right here. Yellow Sea's over here. You got Gobi Desert over here. Here's a map of the walls where they all were at one point. There's been all kinds of dynasties that have built walls, of course. But yeah, a lot of them are known for having their watchtowers uh, along the wall, which were used to guard each section. And if somebody were to attack, they could then send in reinforcements to prevent somebody from seizing control of the wall or breaking through. Here's more pictures of the wall. So yeah, the wall the wall stood for a long time. Uh, now the wall itself, the Great Wall of China, um, uh, the Great Wall. Um, of course, here's a, another one right here. The actual wall you're looking at was the one that was built by the Ming Dynasty, which later took over China. Uh, they 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 controlled China starting in the the 1300s when they took over China. Yeah, when 1350s or 1360s, I think about roughly. And um, what happened was uh, the Mongols in the 13th century broke into China, conquered it, and took it over. I think they killed half the people in China, uh, the Mongols. And the Ming, uh, they who later seized power in the 14th century, decided that they didn't want to have anybody try to attack them again. So they built this famous uh, brick constructed version of the. Great Wall, which you see right there. It was completed in the 1500s. Uh, that actual wall was like somewhere between three to 4,000 miles in length, uh, which the most famous part of it is around Beijing or north of Beijing uh, today. Uh, and of course, the wall itself, you know, it held, it held China for a while, at least the empire for a while, but eventually it failed, proved to be quite a folly uh, in the end. Uh, So-called Manchu, who were in Manchuria, uh, who broke through uh, eventually the wall because uh, uh, China was going through a civil war at the time uh, in, the, in the 1600s. And uh, the Manchu took over all of China and pretty much China's borders expanded to pretty much the way they are now today. Uh, and now it's become like more like a tourist attraction today. So it's not really used for anything. But for a while, I think they, they say, you know, that the Great Wall was even used as like a trade route, you know, as, as a highway, you know, to, to send, you know, stuff from east to west, you know, across China you know, at one point. So anyway, kind of talking about the Great Wall of China. Uh, then the other thing that, uh, of course, Chen Chi Wang Di uh, is known for uh, is he built this, well, actually, first two things I need to talk about first. He built a capital first. I need to mention about that capital that he had. His capital was called Zion Yang, uh, which later is now called Zion or Zion. I think Zion is how they actually say it. Zion, Zion Yang. It's located kind of more into the eastern central part of China is where it is. Uh, it is one of the oldest cities and capitals of China. Uh, it's still used today current population of that city is now 12 million people living there. So it's quite populated. Uh, there's been a bunch of capitals of China that are kind of in the same area that have been built over time. And uh, the one that's built later, uh, which is famous under the Tang Dynasty, is called Chang'an, which you may have heard of, which I think still exists today, uh, the city. I, mean, I don't know what the population now of that city is now, but it's got to be pretty big. Uh, but anyway, uh, but that's basically um, the capital. It was the capital of China for like something like 1,200 years uh, before or more. It might be more than that, may have been. It was over 12 or 1,200 years it was the capital of China. And um, later the capital was later moved to like Beijing or Peking, uh, as they call it too as well. I think Nanking was the capital too of China at one point. 
Uh, you can see there that uh, that city, of course, later called Chang'an, uh, was the location of where the Silk Road started uh, in China, and it pushed westward uh, into the rest of Asia, Middle East, and towards Europe at one point. Uh, of course, Chen Shi, uh, Emperor Chen Shi is famous for his uh, terracotta army that they talked about uh, that he built his famous mausoleum, which may have been built by up to 700,000 workers. So you can't imagine the amount of workers that were used to build the Great Wall. It's got to be even more <laughs> if they built that. Uh, and um, this was supposed to, of course, guard his body in the afterlife. And of course, you saw in the video, he built this terracotta army, which is a statue sculpture army. I think some of the statues were modeled after some of his own soldiers, uh, etc., and it was not found until the 1970s. And of course, the video said it was found in 1974. Some farmers actually found it, unearthed it, around where Zion is today. Yeah, Zion is today. Uh, and over time, they found somewhere between seven to 8,000 of these sculptures of soldiers. Uh, and then they found like chariots, buried, like war chariots were buried in there with them. Horses that went with the chariots were also put in there too as well. These are all sculptures uh, that were put in there. So quite a feat, uh, of course, he was known for doing this. And I guess he thought this would protect him in the afterlife. I've got some images to show you too of it. Uh, so it's a big tourist attraction in China now <clears throat> today. Yeah, they actually had like, you can see some of the hands of like the soldiers, like the, the sculptures, uh, actually had hands where they held like swords or spears in their hands, uh, which I think they found some of the weapons still, I think they're still sharp, <laughs> believe it or not, when they found them. So interesting about that. I uh, later buried it. I think it was kind of hidden, I know, uh, from the public. And uh, there was actually, it was actually, uh, there's a story I've read about, I remember before how he, um, he, he actually booby trapped it or something like that. Like the workers that, a lot of the workers that knew where it was, <laughs> he actually buried some of them alive, supposedly, at least they say. Uh, and then there was like some kind of lake of mercury in there, which was very toxic. Uh, if he went in there, it would probably kill you. So it was kind of like booby-trapped, uh, they think, or something like that. Uh, yeah, he was ruthless, of course. Yeah, they talked about that in the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's one of these uh, emperors that they don't like too much in China uh, to study too much about. Uh, but he was the one that adopted legalism, which I told you about. This legalism was a form of Chinese uh, philosophy, what political philosophy, which was based on the idea of a centralized government and bureaucracy, uh, which he developed. And um, he was one of the first emperors to use what they call eunuchs. I don't know if you know what a eunuch is. <laughs> a eunuch is a castrated person. They would use these castrated people. They would help run the government on a lot of the emperors. This for years that they had these. He was weird too. He banned a lot of books and stuff. He couldn't read anything that was nothing to do with like, like it, was, it had to be farming and medicine. <laughs> I think that was about it. Uh, you could read. You want everybody to be farmers. You know, didn't want anybody to do anything else. Uh, like if it was like something to do with like philosophy or some other idea, he had that banned. So anything to do with Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, if it was there, was all banned uh, pretty much. He even buried scholars, like maybe several thousand may have been buried uh, alive you know, or something like that to, to try to prevent the spread of it, I guess, and all of that. I think he tried to stop the spread of like Buddhism, I think. It was starting to come in, I guess, at that point, whatever. So anyway, um, now his reign was a short-lived reign. Now, like I said, he, they, they weren't around. The dynasty itself got overthrown uh, starting around 206 B.C. Uh, and another dynasty, of course, emerged to overthrow them and take over China. That was the Han dynasty, which, of course, was considered one of the uh, dynasties that was part of the Golden Age of China. I think the Han and the Tang dynasty because they're the two big ones during that time. Uh, and um, so let's go ahead and move on. And we'll talk about the Han dynasty, uh, which came in uh, next. Uh, Han, of course, would expand China. China gets bigger 
uh, as an empire under him, under them. Of course, that's the guy on the left who was the big emperor, the most famous emperor, Emperor Wu, who I'll talk about later, uh, who was well known. Uh, but the Qin, uh, they would collapse to, uh, they think close to 220. Well, actually, it's when it started about, but it was around 206, I think, when the actual rebellion took place under him. And there was a ruler named Lu Pang, or also pronounced Lu Bang, uh, seized power in China. It took him like three or four years. I think 206, I want to say 202, I think it was about. And um, the guy that came into power um, was later called another name after I think he died, uh, which was Emperor Gao Su of the Han, uh, they called it, which meant, it meant different translations, but it meant either exalted emperor or high founder or high ruler. I get different translations on what it meant. And um, Lu Pang or Bang was originally some kind of commoner. He came from the lower class and was a Chinese general that overthrew the Qin dynasty and then seize power. So I think it took him like three or four years to actually overthrow him. Um, I think it's like 206, 202, I think is actually the range of when it was when he overthrew him. This emperor went on uh, to do different things. Uh, we made a lot of reforms in the state. And of course, one thing that uh, the emperor Lu Pang Gao Su, Gao Su did was he uh, introduced Confucianism to the state. So they began to kind of add that in because for a long time they you know tried to stop confucianism ban it whatever ban the the, the teachings philosophies of confucius uh, and all of that so he started doing that uh, also started adopting civil service exams something confucius had wanted uh to prevent corruption in the government uh, and so under him and the han dynasty they began to actually do that uh, at the time so that's why well, he's important in the Han Dynasty. Uh, he's probably one of the most famous emperors up there with, um, of course, the other one I'll talk about next, which is uh, Emperor Emperor Wu. Yeah, Wu D or Wu T. There's, of course, another picture of him right there of Gao Su. Also pronounced Kao Su, uh, that they also call him uh, as well. So 206, 202 is about the time range when he would kind of form the Han state. And by the way, the, the name Han, if you wonder where it came from, the name Han was originated from, I believe, a river in China called the Han River. You know, and Han Chinese, by the way, is like most Chinese are related back to them. You know, if you know about that. And also a lot of the Chinese languages, you know, today used like Mandarin, et cetera, goes back to that time period. So as yeah, the classical China we're talking about, uh, of course, we'll get into uh, later. I'll get more into the expansion of China, but Han is Han is Han is around for over 400 years uh, that they're in power. And it's like a golden age, of course, right there. Now, we'll talk about uh, a little bit for a few minutes about Emperor uh, Wu, uh, often called Wu Di or Wu Ti, uh, usually, which means, by the way, uh, means martial emperor is what the name meant. And ha, uh, Wu, Emperor Wu of the Han was um, one of the longest reigning emperors in Chinese history. He's not quite the longest. He reigned about 54 years. I think there was an emperor that reigned, I want to say in the 17th century, 61 years, I think it was. So he's like the second longest, I think, overall. But he's one of the longest reigning, definitely one of the most famous emperors of that time. Uh, he's known for a lot of things. Uh, Emperor Wu. Uh, first of all, one of the first things he's famous for is uh, under him, the Chinese begin to expand their empire. It gets larger, uh, the empire, and I kind of give you some things here where they went into, but China began to expand into Korea, which China for a long time controlled Korea and influenced Korea up to modern times uh, at one point. Uh, they, yeah, they conquered the southern part of China, even pushing into Vietnam, like maybe the northern part of Vietnam. And they did actually conquer part of western China, mostly through the Gobi Desert area uh, overall. I think I've got a map showing you what um, the empire looked uh, under them. They don't, you know, not quite controlling all of China at that point, but 
You can see it's starting to expand westward uh, at that point, but most of the western part is not conquered. They have annually control like Manchuria, which is above Korea right here. But you can see they had a population maybe of 60 million at one point. So starting to become one of the most populated uh, empires in the world. Uh, Chang An, of course, is the name they call the capital. Zion, uh, yes, Zion, they call it Zion, which is right here, Chang An. <clears throat> so Tang is, I think the Tang called that later, I believe. Now, um, more about uh, this ruler we're talking about. Of course, yeah, he was a military style ruler. Uh, one thing he was famous for, he was well known for defeating the Shang Nu uh, that were threatening the northern border. And uh, with that, he was able to push the, uh, the actual Great Wall fortification westward, like pushing it into the Gobi Desert uh, to the west. Uh, and um, after they did that, one of the first things that they say that Emperor Wu was known for, maybe close to the 130 range BC, they believe he was the one that started the Silk Road uh, in China. Silk Road, of course, was a famous network of trade routes that kind of run from Asia and China uh, to the West, uh, like it through like parts of like Asia, the Middle East, Europe. Uh, they actually think parts of it did link up with like eventually later Mongolia and even Russia uh, to the North. So they went Northward as well. Parts of it, they think, I think they think that the um, trade route may have been at one point, close to 4,000, uh, you can see different numbers on it, three to 4,000 miles long, maybe longer than that uh, overall. And uh, it started, like I said, from where uh, Chang An is, or what they call Sion. Of course, I told you about the, the capital of China at the time, uh, and went westward. It goes into India uh, through the Himalayas uh, mountains, uh, then pushes westward uh, into the Persian Empire, uh, they think the Royal Road may have helped link up part of it uh, at one point, which I told you about before. They went from Iran, Iraq, into Turkey. Uh, then they do think that the the actual Silk Road, of course, helped link up the Roman Empire. And, you know, the uh, Han at the time were trading with the Romans uh, in the West. So the Romans were able to get like silk and other things uh, from them uh, overall. Uh, of course, it's called Silk Road because of the you know silk uh, being produced uh, by the silkworm. The Chinese were very secretive about how it was made. They didn't want foreigners knowing you know, how it was made. I think there was even a case where it would put people to death that they tried to tell people how it was actually made. A lot of people in the West didn't know it was made from the silkworm uh, and all that. Um, of course, the Chinese have been very secretive a lot about a lot of things. Like they've been very mistrustful of you know foreigners. Still are today, even in modern times. Like if you were to go to China, uh, and um, of course, other goods came down the Silk Road. You can see gunpowder. Yeah, that was a big one. Paper, of course, which the Chinese invented. Uh, porcelain, you know, like China, huh? like China plates. You know, porcelain, uh, tea, spices, etc all kinds of inventions, compass, crossbow, talked about, probably came westward, you know. <laughs> and yeah, put on the bottom there, diseases. Yeah, that's something that China and parts of Asia there has spread to the world is diseases. Now, I think we know that now with the coronavirus, you know, some people call it the China virus, you know, because it came from over there, like Wuhan, right, China? I think it was, but they did help spread the bubonic plague. They think it originated in China, spread by rats, and it probably came west where the Mongols conquered like parts of the uh, west, uh, and uh, that became one of the worst plagues in history, killing like probably 100 million people later, up to modern times. Uh, also, other things, you know, the Han were known for developing the first like printed books, something they're kind of known for, which other people will copy later in the west, and so they would make books, like they make paper out of like bamboo and wood, something they kind of figured out. Uh, and uh, the Han were known for having the first printing presses. People think of like Go uh, Johann Gutenberg, right, getting the printing press and all that in Europe. But uh, actually, that wasn't the first printing press. First printing presses were developed by the Han. 
I think the Tang Dynasty had them too as well later. They used what they call block printing or wood block printing, where they would print these little blocks with like symbols on it, like the calligraphy of the Chinese writing. And then they could use ink and just stamp stuff to make, you know, either seals or stamping or just print stuff on paper, uh, basically. That's more or less how they do, you know, printing later. Same kind of thing, except I think in Europe they start using, instead of wood, they use metal as the actual blocks uh, to actually print. So that, that is something that they're known for. Um, now, later, uh, there's a period uh, under the Han. So here's a map showing you, by the way, the Silk Road. You can see where it starts, where Chang'an is. Uh, uh, Zion right here, of course. Uh, and then, of course, you can see it goes westward, you know, through uh, China, India, Persia, Arabia, and then, of course, the, to the Roman Greek world, of course. Constantinople, I think, was one place where it eventually went to um, in the West, just like Turkey, Greece. So uh, now there is a period where, uh, of course, there's some, if you want to look at this, we've kind of already talked about a lot of this, but these are kind of things that they think the Han may have helped invent. Though some of these may have been already around already, like the iron plow, possibly, but those are things that they may have invented, uh, the Han. The Han is broken down into two um, periods, by the way. They have the former Han and the later Han. It's called, uh, and uh, the former Han is called the Western Han. Later Han is called the Eastern Han. Uh, and there was some kind of rebellion that happened at the end of the uh, Western period there. And a ruler named Wang Mang took over and briefly reigned with a separate dynasty called the Zen Dynasty, it was called. Uh, but he was overthrown uh, eventually that dynasty. And the Han continued to the third century CE uh, when they ruled. So you can see their dynasty was around for over 400 years um, overall. I'll put that on the screen right there for you if you want. And, uh, but they got, they got overthrown and they, they would rain down to the third century. Now, what happened if the Han, Han went out? The Han, um, China kind of broke up uh, into uh, competing states. There was a period called the Three Kingdoms period where China was broken up into three states called the Wai, Su, and the Tang. And there was a dynasty called the Su dynasty, which reigned for about, <laughs> they were around for only like, I think it was how many years? 40 years they were around. It went around very long, uh, the Su dynasty, which was around the 6th, 7th century. And then they had this other dynasty that came in that's famous in China called the Tang dynasty. They emerged in the 7th century uh, to reign China, reign over China. 7 to about the 10th century, kind of like at the end of the ancient period of China, so-called golden age of China, they dub it. And they reigned from uh, Zion, which was also called Chang'an. They, they, that's actually what they called it. I think that was the name the Tang changed it to uh, eventually, which means, by the way, in Chinese, perpetual peace. That's what the name meant. And uh, under the Tang, uh, the population of that city, by the way, grew to await what they think was a population of like one to two million people. So as it was one of the first uh, million man city uh, that was in the world, at least in Asia. Uh, and it had a founder. Uh, the founder of the Tang dynasty was an emperor named Li Yuan. Yeah, L-I-Y-U-A-N, Li Yuan. Uh, he was later called Emperor Gao Su of the Tang. Uh, and he created the actual dynasty uh, in the 7th century. I think they all also call him Tang Gao Su. That's what they called him as well. Also, he had a... Um, they had a, a female ruler that reigned later that was also famous, named Empress Wu of the Tang, sometimes called Wu Ch Chow, I think they call her. And uh, she's like the only one they had that was a female ruler. And I think she was like an ex-concubine, um, like mistress of one of the emperors and seized power after he died and briefly reigned for a bunch of years. So, so yeah, they never had a female ruler, which is kind of rare for that time period. Um, uh, the Tang was also the peak of Chinese culture, they think, at least up to the ancient times and golden age of China or the medieval times. So Chinese art, pottery, poetry, literature, 
uh, peaked at that time. Like Tang pottery is very valuable, you know, about it. And then Buddhism took off a lot. And they say Buddhism became very popular uh, in China. So it took up to about the Tang dynasty for it to really take off uh, as a, a philosophical religious type system uh, influenced by Buddha. Taoism also was very popular as well. Also, one more thing about the Tang. Under the Tang, uh, they had what they call the Grand Canal was completed, they believe. They think it was started under the Su dynasty, S-U-I, before. Uh, and just for a few years, they started constructing it, and then the Tang completed it, uh, they think. And uh, the Grand Canal, which is still around the day, uh, is an intercoastal canal system that they built on their eastern coast of China. And it was used to link up the Yellow River, the Wang Ho, with the Yangtze River. And so this enabled them to expand trade networks on uh, the eastern part of China, ship stuff. Kind of like how we have our intercoastal canal system we've got, um, like in the southern part of Louisiana. You know, they've got the same kind of thing uh, that they can as well. So the Tang, the Tang are around until the 10th century. Uh, and then um, they had some other dynasties later. They have the Sung dynasty. I'll probably we'll talk about that one. S-U-N-G, that briefly reigned for a while. I will talk later about the Mongols. The Mongols later take over China. They have the Yuan dynasty that reigns after Genghis Khan invades, conquers China. So they have that dynasty, the Yuan dynasty that reigns. And later they have two more dynasties uh, that reign, which are the Ming dynasty, the one that built the brick Great Wall of China. And then the last, the last dynasty of China, China, both those are modern times. Ming was like 1368 to 1644. And they had the Manchu that reigned. Manchu dynasty reigned from 1644 to 1912. But China was not that powerful like at the end of that period. They kind of began to decline in the modern times. They weren't much of a rival to like modern powers later like Europe and Japan, which will be better than them, more powerful, etc. But you can see like under the Han, under the Tang, that was the peak of the whole golden age of China, as they called it in ancient times. All right, let me go wrap up. And today I'm going to, of course, uh, for a, spend a few times kind of just reviewing, and that's pretty much it uh, for this lecture. Uh, so it says, uh, what was the period of the warring states that occurred uh, before the advent of imperial China. Well, that was a period where China uh, was controlled uh, by um, multiple states, like up to seven major states. Uh, and that was between the 5th and the 3rd centuries BC. I think it started in 481, goes down to about 221 BC. So all these states competed against each other. And there was one kingdom called Qin or Qin. It was also called that dynasty too, Qin dynasty. They would emerge to conquer China in the third century BC, which is about close to about 221 BC. And of course, the first emperor China I've told you was an emperor named Chen Shi, Chen Shi Wang Di, called all kinds of names, usually Emperor Chen or Emperor Ken or Ken Shi. And um, he was the one that was famous for unifying all of China into one empire, one state at that point. He began some expansion. Uh, and then I told you he was famous for his construction of the Great Wall of China, uh, which was built on their northern border, uh, close to like Mongolia in northern China. Uh, and um, why did he build it? Uh, what foreign invaders were the Chinese attempting to block from attacking into China? Uh, it was built to block foreign barbarians from coming in, uh, which was one of the main groups that I told you about was the Shang Nu, which were Asiatic peoples that lived in Mongolia. They were related to the Mongols or the Huns. It's kind of debated about how they're related. Most of them live in the Mongolian steppe, which is kind of between Mongolia and China. They, they basically mostly tried to block them out. And uh, nicknames of the Great Wall, of course, the name has, it's got all kinds of names. Uh, 10,000 Li Wall, uh, the Chinese Wall. Great Wall of China, of course, modern name. Uh, some people call it, of course, the Wall of Death uh, because of the amount of people that 
maybe died building it uh, and all that. And I went through, I talked about some of the statistics about it. Although it's debated about how long it is, you know, well, at least three to 5,000 miles is usually the average length. I think three to 4,000 is how long the mean wall was, which was built in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, what capital did uh, Chen Chi Wang Di build as a massive tomb? It was called Zion, uh, X I A X yeah X I A N uh, Zion or Z actually Zion Yang, what they called it originally, uh, then shortened to Zion, uh, and then now it's called Chang An, was the later name uh, that it was also called by the Tang, yeah Chang An. Um, so those are all the kind of like the same thing. Uh, what guarded it, and what was its nickname? Uh, well, they're talking about, um, it's kind of out of order. I don't know why. But they're talking about the tomb here. Yeah, the um, Chen, Emperor Chen Shi was famous for building um, a massive mausoleum at its capital, Zion Yang. And it was called the Terracotta Army. Uh, it was a statue army he constructed, which was had close to 8,000 statues. And it was supposed to guard his tomb in the afterlife. Uh, of course, it wasn't found until 1974. Uh, what dynasty conquered the, the Qin or Qin dynasty or Qin empire of the Chinese? Um, that, of course, was uh, the Han, Han dynasty. And it was founded by this ruler named Liu Pang. Uh, Liu Pang, of course, was later known as Emperor Gaosu of the Han. And he was the one that unified the state uh, they began expanding it and even introduced Confucianism to, of course, uh, all of China. Uh, the greatest ruler was Emperor, Emperor Wu of the Han, or Wu Di, or Wu Ti, he's called, uh, who reigned between like the 2nd and 1st centuries B.C., close to about 130s range, about uh, when he came to power. What, what was it, 141? I think 141 maybe when he came to power. And... Um, his name meant Martial Emperor because he was a military-style emperor known for his conquests and expansion of, um, of China, expanding China southward uh, into Vietnam and southern China, Korea, and, of course, expanding it westward uh, into the Gobi Desert. Uh, they believe he also helped found the Silk Road uh, also as well, which was that trade network that was set up that linked up Asia with the West and uh, they believe it uh, connected trade with like areas like India, Persia, uh, the Middle East, the Roman Empire. Uh, so it went all the way from like, you know, India, uh, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Europe. Uh, what types of innovations, innovations were Han known for? Uh, I told you they were known for developing paper uh, and uh, new types of uh, printing methods, like the wood block printing or block printing uh, that they were known for. Now, yeah, they may have invented things like the iron plow and so on that you saw earlier that they had. Uh, but under the Han, they become pretty advanced. Uh, they even produced the first um, Chinese dictionaries, like printing out like, you know, what the language of the Chinese is. And a lot of the bases of like Chinese languages later were from the Han. So the so-called Han Chinese pretty much related, of course, back to them and all that. Uh, they also had two periods of uh, the Han dynasty, uh, which I told you were the Western Han and the Eastern Han, uh, which were called different names. Uh, I think they were called the um, later Han, and then they have the, um, yeah, the early Han and the later Han, as they're called. So I think if you remember correctly, they're right here if you want to look at it. But yeah, former Han is called the Western Han. Later Han is called the Eastern Han. It's kind of confusing, I know. But um, And then, yeah, um, what is the nickname of China, Age of China around the period of the Han? It's usually called the Golden Age of China. That's what they called it, uh, which I guess it started after Qin came in and the Han took over. And then it goes up to like the time of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, which I mentioned earlier. So anyway, uh, that's pretty much it um, about ancient China. Uh, I'm not going to go into later China, of course. Uh, I might talk about the Mongols later. I think when we get more towards like talking about European history and all that. Uh, but 
Uh, that's going to be it for today uh, with this lecture. A little bit shorter, but that's going to wrap up this period on China. Of course, next week I am going to be moving on to talk about ancient Greece. That's going to be our next thing. So um, make sure you uh, finish up these uh, assignments I've got posted uh, for this week and next week. Uh, the one on the Persian Empire, of course, Venetians and Israelites. Uh, make sure you complete that. Uh, also, you got that new assignment I just posted as well, uh, which is, of course, on um, the Great Wall of China documentary. So I don't know if does anybody have any questions. Oh, I have a question from in the India. Yeah, sure. And it was uh, what two cities were discovered in the 1920s? Um, oh, yeah, I, I talked about that before. One. It was Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa were the two. Yeah, Mahinjo Dar and Harapa. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Thank you. All right. So um, right. now, um, anybody, if anybody else, has, if anybody else has a question, let me know. You can send me a, like, you can send me a text or whatever. You know, just message if you have got a question about something when I'm lecturing. So just just remember that. Or later, you can post it to my YouTube channel, and you've got a question about something as well. Also, don't forget before we go, uh, also uh, vocab due next week as well. So start posting that to the speed grader uh, for me to grade. Uh, we, by the way, do not have classes Thursday and Friday. I don't know if I've told you that or not, but we do have a fall break, August 8th to the 9th. So I don't know what you're doing for class, but I know I don't, I'm not having any classes on Thursday and Friday and all of that. Uh, so hope you all have a good fall break. Uh, coming up. I don't know how it's going to be. They got this hurricane out there, you know, so we'll have to see what happens with that. I hope it doesn't cause problems for us uh, over here. We'll just have to watch the weather and how that affects, you know, school schedule later. So that's about it for today. Uh, I'm going to post this, by the way, lecture later on my YouTube channel. So I'm going to get that up after, after I finish this lecture. Y'all have a good weekend coming up in fall break. You know, uh, of course, I have another lecture next week, of course, two lectures probably next week, hopefully, which will be on the Greeks. So that's it for now. So take care. So have a good morning.